Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. And by No Foods, No Grain, No Gluten, No Guilt. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, flying with diabetes. Two private pilots, Douglas Cairns and Thor Dahl, have completed a new record, visiting the most U.S. states in 24 hours, all to show that a T1D diagnosis shouldn't ground you, a far different statement than Douglas heard 30 years ago. In confirming my diagnosis, he literally just turned around to me and said, it's confirmed you are a diabetic and you were a pilot. So it was a very devastating set of words. I mean, I kind of thank him because despite being quite cruel in his diagnosis, he he gave me a great quote. (laughs) He really did. And uh, I mean, I'd love to meet him and have a chat with him now. At that time, 1989, no country would allow you to fly with T1D, even on a private pilot's license. But that's changed. We'll talk about what it takes to become a pilot when you live with diabetes, how Douglas and Thor want to keep pushing the limits, and what they do to make sure it's safe. Plus, a little bit of an editorial this week. I posted in my local group about the really widespread use of the word dread. I'm seeing it everywhere in parenting conversations about diabetes. I'll tell you why I think that's got to stop. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to another week of the show. You know we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes. My son, Benny, was diagnosed right before he turned 2. He is now 13 and a half, and my background is in broadcasting. That's how you get the podcast, which we've been doing now for more than three years. So thank you so much for listening and making the show as popular as it has become. It's really been amazing to see it grow. I am very excited because as you listen, uh, this coming weekend, I will be hosting the Bike Beyond documentary screening here in Charlotte, North Carolina. The Charlotte Film Society and a group called Families Fighting Type 1 are hosting the event. Diabetes Connections is part of the hosting as well. I'm thrilled about that. But this is a screening of Bike Beyond the documentary. I will link up more information in the show notes. We followed them along on this cross-country bike ride last summer. This was that group of all amateur bike riders, all with Type 1. They went coast to coast. And uh, it was a pretty wild uh, journey to begin with. But uh, the documentary is it just looks incredible. I haven't seen it yet. I have seen the trailers and some clips from it. And I'm so excited to be part of this. So I'm seeing it. There's a Q&A panel. And I'll be happy to tell you more about it. If you want to host your own screening, um, I'll link that up as well. Bike Beyond is asking people to do that, making it happen. It's a really cool event. And I'm excited to see a lot of local diabetes families there. Last week, I talked a little bit about camp, bringing you Benny's um, very silly at times, interview about going to non-diabetes summer camp. I'm going to talk more about that at the end of the show, uh, more of an update about his experience. Spoiler, I did grab that Dexcom receiver. I made it about an hour after he came home. I showed a lot of restraint there, I think. Well, you know, you don't see any numbers for a month. <laughs> I, was, I think I said on the show I would wait till the next morning. <laughs> anyway, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But I do hope that today's show gives some hope to a parent of a child who wants to grow up to be a pilot, or maybe someone who has diabetes, an adult, who you know gave it up or wants to take lessons and just thought it wasn't part of what they could do. I also hope it shows all of us that if we really want something, we have to keep pushing to make it happen. Talking to Douglas and Thor about flying. You're going to hear how much it means to them. I am so glad they got to do this. This record is really kind of bonkers when you hear about what they did. All right, first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. You know, in elementary school and in, even in preschool, Benny was not at all self-conscious about diabetes. He would show his friends how it was done. He would always check and dose right in the middle of class. But he is going into eighth grade now, and he's still comfortable with diabetes. He doesn't hide it, but he doesn't want type 1 to ever be the center of attention. And the Dexcom helps so much with that. It's made it so easy. Benny can glance at his smart device to give him his reading. He wears a watch, but he's this school allows him to actually look at his phone at certain times of the day. And it's amazing. Dexcom is the first FDA-approved device to let you make treatment decisions without pricking your finger. The G5 and the factory-calibrated G6, which we are using right now. 
really love, love the G6. It's been so great for us. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. My guests this week were trailblazers to begin with, and now they're world record holders. Douglas Cairns and Thor Dahl partnered with Dexcom this summer to break the world record for visiting the most U.S. states in 24 hours. They extended the record from 23 to 29 states, all to raise awareness for pilots with type 1 diabetes. Now, if that record seemed to go by quickly, here's what they did. They took off and they landed 28 times in 24 hours for a total of 29 states. And as you'll hear, it didn't go exactly as planned. Did you ever hear the one about the airport that was unexpectedly closed? No landing? We'll talk about that right now. Only eight countries allow pilots with insulin-treated diabetes to fly at all. Both Douglas from Scotland and Thor from Norway were grounded as military pilots due to their condition. And now their mission is to prove that people with type 1 are fully capable of flying safely and for long periods of time. The flight was sponsored by Dexcom. It's pretty cool to see the pictures of the plane with the CGM company on the side. I like that. I'm going to link that up and the map. And uh, the map has the route that they took. They took off in Maine on July 27th and landed in Minnesota 24 hours later. Here's my chat with Thor and Douglas. Douglas and Thor, thanks for making time. It was not easy to coordinate this, but I really appreciate you jumping on. Let me first ask you, what did you do here? This was a world record for visiting the most U.S. states. Douglas, let me start with you. There's a world record for this? What do you have to do? Uh, sure. Well, actually, the the world record is basically visiting as many U.S. states as possible within 24 hours. Photographs have to be taken of the individuals carrying it out. And previously, it had been um, people driving cars and taking commercial flights between each state. And uh, Thor, um, when Thor visited me earlier this year in February, he mentioned uh, this idea and he was very keen to do it. And the idea really appealed to me as well. So we put a plan together to carry out the world record in a private plane. Mm. So stepping out of the plane at each airport for each state, taking a photograph and then trying to break the existing record, which was 23. And we got 29 over the 24 hours. Thor, when you had this idea or you decided to do it, what, how did that come about? It's actually a few years ago that I first uh, had the idea. I was already uh, accepted into this uh, pilot program. So when I read about this uh, preceding record in the newspaper in Norway, I read that these guys, this was actually the the one before, so it was 22 states. It was recently broken to 23. But I read that they've done it in commercial planes and cars. And uh, because I was going through a pilot program, I realized that it should be pretty easy to beat in a private airplane. And since then, so I've, I've been, I had it in the back of my head, but it really just uh, uh, popped up when I was talking to Douglas and uh, hearing about his previous records and, and projects. How do you two know each other? Douglas, let me ask you. Well, actually, it was, it was Thor who, who got in touch um, through uh, a website that I run called Flying with Diabetes. And basically, it's a series of awareness-raising flying projects. And it's linked in with another group um, that I help coordinate called Pilots with Diabetes, which is very much for pilots pilots with diabetes advocacy and trying to help persuade aviation authorities to open the doors and be more flexible and enable pilots with insulin-treated diabetes to fly. And uh, Thor had been grounded uh, with his military helicopter flying role um, in Norway. And my own background had been uh, as a grounded Royal Air Force pilot and flying instructor in 1989. And uh, Thor, when he found my details, got in touch. So initially by email and then visited me in in the UK in February. And uh, an absolute pleasure to meet Thor and and have a very similar background as well. Yeah. And let's talk about flying with diabetes, as you say. Thor, what happened? Were you already in the military? You were already flying helicopters when you were diagnosed? Yeah, uh, I had actually just graduated from uh, to have my license one month before I was diagnosed. Uh, in Norway, we do our helicopter Air Force training with the U.S. Army because uh, we're too small to have our own education. So we have spots with uh, the U.S. Army. So I just 
returned from one year in uh, USA, flying Blackhawks and a few other helicopters. Uh, so it was just before my first flight in uh, Norway uh, after graduating that I had to go through this annual medical check that all pilots have to do and that I have done several times. And that's when they uh, they told me that I had uh, high blood sugars, which uh, led to the diagnosis. Had you always wanted to be a pilot? Is this something that you wanted and, and I assume trained to do for a long time? Yeah, it's definitely something I always uh, wanted. Uh, I think that's probably common for most people who are pilots, that they, that's something they really want and dream about. Uh, and I had been uh, in the program or in the selection process and training uh, combined since mid-2014. Douglas, let me ask you, I mean, your story is uh, a few years earlier, but sounds like it was very much the same. Can you tell us what happened to you? Yeah, sure. Um, I was I was basically carrying out my boyhood dreams to fly jets in the British Royal Air Force. And I'd gone through the training over four years. I'd been uh, trained up as a flying instructor and I was instructing on Jet Provost um, at that time, which is a basic jet trainer. And uh, over a period of six weeks, uh, at the end of 1988 and early 1999, um, I had all those classic symptoms of, of type 1 diabetes without being diagnosed, so losing weight, fatigue, passing copious amounts of water. But I was a classic pilot. I did not, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't want to go to the doctor um, for fear of being told that my medical and my flying career might be at risk. And I, I didn't feel particularly bad at all. I was just losing weight and, and uh, just aware of that. And I'd had flu. Um, but I eventually went to the base doctor who took um, a quick blood sugar test. And uh, in confirming my diagnosis, he literally turned around to me and said, it's confirmed, you are a diabetic and you were a pilot. So it was a very devastating set of words. I mean, I kind of thank him because despite being quite cruel in his diagnosis, he, he gave me a great quote. Yes, he did. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> He really did. And uh, I mean, I'd love to meet him and have a chat with him now. Basically, he, he was absolutely right, because in 1989, there was no country anywhere worldwide would even allow anyone to fly on a private pilot's license, let alone have a commercial or military professional flying career. And it's all because of the risk of going low in blood sugar, impaired judgment, and in the worst case, incapacitation. Uh, and, you know, thankfully, that situation has changed. But for me, exactly the same as Thor, absolutely devastating. Your boyhood dreams have suddenly been smashed. And I could have stayed in the Air Force, but as a, a ground-based um, administration or supply officer, and I had only joined the Air Force to fly. That was my mm. passion and my, my ambition. So for me, it was a very straightforward decision to leave and embark upon a new career, a very unexpected one in finance. But you know, the rather interesting has allowed me to get back to flying in, in many respects and uh, kind of got on to do some really fantastic flying projects. But no, at the time, devastating uh, and a huge life change, basically. Wow. And, and I want to talk more about what, how you got back to it. But Thor, what did you do next? Um, you know, this was a, a little uh, more, and forgive me, Douglas, a little bit more recent history where people may be more educated about diabetes. <laughs> Were you able to fly with a private license in Norway or was all flying off the table? Uh, in Norway, for now, all flying is off mm. the table. It's uh, th There was no the details, but there's just uh, very few um, NATO countries in the world that allows any type of flying. It's like five or six, uh, maybe a few more countries at all. But as you said, world has come a long way with the diagnosis and knowledge about it. So after a few days after getting diagnosed, I started to just do a little bit of research just in case. Is there any way uh, I can be flying again? And that's uh, when I discovered that there's actually countries allowing it and there's progress on that matter worldwide and I started to learn more about the diagnosis and make up my own meanings about the regulations and uh, how good of control it's possible to achieve and just through weeks and months I became more and more sure that this is something that I can manage uh, thanks to new medicine and medical uh, equipment that the rules uh, that now existing uh, does not uh, consider. They're based on all medicine. And well, yeah, uh, since then I've been 
I'm still employed in the Air Force, so I've been working the last year with the selection and recruitment of new pilots uh, while I've on the side have been trying to convince the Medical Institute in Norway of my situation and my suitability as of the medical uh, clearance. And uh, they've been hearing me. It's a running case, but the chances have increased enormously for me to actually get back uh, flying in the Air Force. But there's uh, there's still things to sort out. But yeah, yeah. it's... Uh, going in the right direction. That's fantastic. All right, Douglas, let me pose a question that I think a lot of people may be thinking, and it's a little unpleasant to ask. Should you fly? Should people with type 1 diabetes be allowed to fly? We'll get Douglas's answer to that question in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneTouch. For seven years, OneTouch Vario test strips have delivered reliable results you can trust. And did you know they have the lowest copay on the most health plans and are always covered on traditional Medicare Part B? To upgrade today to the OneTouch Vario Flex Meter, visit diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneTouch logo. Coverage and payment may be subject to coinsurance, deductible, and patient eligibility requirements. LifeScan does not guarantee coverage or payment. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneTouch logo. Now back to Douglas on whether it is safe to have people with diabetes become pilots. The answer to your question is a resounding yes, but with probably a few observations attached to it as well. So currently there are eight countries that allow either private flying or a combination of private and commercial flying. And basically, you know, there's a recognition by these countries that diabetes technology and management has improved significantly over the last 20 to 25 years. And there's a, a very strong message from all the countries that in order to um, qualify, you need to pass a number of, of uh, requirements. And a very key one is good overall control of your diabetes. And also having hypoglycemia awareness is a very important point. So once you demonstrate good overall control of diabetes, uh, then you have a very good blood sugar testing protocol to ensure safe flying. So basically, all the countries imply very, very similar protocols. So it's testing blood sugar within half an hour of takeoff, each hour into a, a, a flight, and then within half an hour of landing. And the blood test range typically needs, well, for the USA, for private flying, it needs to be between 100 and 300. If you're below 100, you ingest 15 grams readily absorbable carbohydrate, bring sugars back up. If you're above 300, you land as soon as practicable. Or if in other countries, if you're commercial flying, then the control is handed over to the other second pilot because there is a requirement to be in a two-crew operation. So, you know, for private flying, the system works very well. I've been using it for actually almost 19 years now and almost 4,000 flying hours, which is the equivalent of a military flying career. So <laughs> I've wow. been delighted to use the U.S. system since 2000. And in all that time, not once have I had concern for safety due to diabetes control. The diabetes management literally becomes part of your cockpit checks and controls. And I am very happy to you know, basically describe it as a safe and very effective system to ensure safe flying. So to answer your question, yes, uh, I think enabling pilots with insulin-treated diabetes or type 1 diabetes, I think is really a very good thing to do. And it's good to see countries gradually considering it and some opening the doors. We've got a lot of work to persuade more countries to do that, but so far it's encouraging progress. Fantastic. So let's talk about the record. Thor, what was your idea here in the U.S.? Did you have a map in your head already? Um, I imagine there are certain states that are tiny, closer together, easier to fly to. How did you plan for the record breaker? It was to just sit down with a map with uh, all of the states. I think it was quite obvious, the route. I, I, I <laughs> doubt that there is a better route than the one we chose. It didn't put that much into the rough route, but I'm pretty confident that it's uh, close to the optimal uh, route that we chose. And then... Uh, Douglas, who has been flying a lot in all of those areas, went in and he chose uh, certain airports that were... And there are a lot of airports. People are probably not aware of it, but they're <laughs> all over the place. Most of them were uh, spot on on the way to the next state. So 
not too much navigation just to find airports. Tell us a little bit about how it went. So you get in the plane, you fly. It looks, I'm trying, did you start in New Hampshire? Or you started in Maine? Start in Maine. All right, so you, so you get in the plane, you start in Maine. Obviously, you're going to start in the Northeast because all the tiny little states are close together. How does it go? You, you right. fly for an hour, you go to a small airport, you jump out, you jump in, take a picture, jump in. Tell me about what it was like when you did it. Yeah, that's pr- pretty accurate. Uh, <laughs> in the beginning, it was a lot less. A lot less than one hour. I think the longest flight was between one and two hours. So there were a lot of really short <laughs> flights in the beginning. I mean, the first stop was to me maybe the most exciting to just see how effective uh, we could make it and see if our planning was accurate regarding uh, time on ground and uh, all of those delays. And it went really effective. So uh, it was a good one <laughs> until we got to the third state. So New Hampshire, where. are uh, the airport that we had planned to land on when we got there it was a big excess on uh, both sides of the runway meaning it was closed and uh, bulldozers on the runway so uh, obviously not a good place to land so we had to uh, in the air find a new airport and get up there and uh, as it was very early in the flight it was a little bit annoying because we didn't know how much uh, time we would have uh, in spare uh, but we realized pretty quick that we were able to make that lost time up again. Great. Douglas, all right, here's a dumb question. Airport is closed for the day? Does that happen? Air- under construction? I mean, how do they do that? <laughs> do you know, it is the first time this has ever happened in, <laughs> in all the flying that I've done because <laughs> before each flight, you call um, a flight uh, service station um, briefer and you, you get a briefing on the, the upcoming weather. And any, they call them NOTAMs, uh, notices to airmen, which are any pertinent information for each airfield you're visiting. And normally, the, the NOTAM would notify the brief pilot that the airfield is closed. So I was really quite stunned. <laughs> I was kind of looking at it and doing double takes. Said, right, this has never happened before. But wow. uh, um, you know, we were very fortunate that um, I, I mean, initially we headed for different air, airfield and realised. It was on the wrong side of a river. So we'd been to New Hampshire. We were trying to land in Vermont. And then we realized pretty quickly that that airfield would not count for Vermont. So we then detoured, I think it was probably about 30 miles north to a place called Rutland. Uh, So to answer your question, I was really quite stunned that this had happened and uh, thought, crikey, if we're landing there at nighttime, it could have been quite interesting. Mm -hmm. But indeed, the runway lights wouldn't have been working, I suspect. So it was food for thought. And yet, very early on, and indeed, as Thor mentioned, we're thinking, well, I wonder how this is going to work out time-wise. But actually, it it did work out really well. Um, Each airport were on the ground for a pretty brief amount of time. We had three refueling stops. And it all worked very, very efficiently. So there were were there any other bumps in the road or bumps in the air as you went further along the day? We we had two areas of bad weather that we had to detour around. So we were trying to land at Grant County in West Virginia, and we just realized there's a huge area of storms. Um, Thor had a SIM card, so we could then link that to our iPad, which had, had a navigation database, which then fired up the weather radar. So we could see the extent of the bad weather. And as we were traveling by and, and away from the airfield, you could see it was clearing up. So we were able to basically turn back to the airfield and land um, just as the, the weather had been clearing. So that was a potential bump. Um, I mean, we can expect weather during the summer of this nature, but we were flying between two frontal systems with the odd pop-up large storm. And we just had a second area to avoid around the mountains of uh, South Carolina. Uh, I think the, the only other pest, you know, uh, slightly stressful bit was the the bugs on the ground in Arkansas, which I think both Thor and I were quite shocked at at night time. So, uh, the bugs? so no, those are the only potential bumps. Yes, well, yeah. you might want to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> Tell me about no, that. That terrible. I've been counting. We were on the ground for what was it like five minutes, Douglas? Yes. And yes, I've, about that. I've, I've counted more than sixty bites on my left leg alone. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. What? Wow. That's crazy. That was not something you would expect along the way. No, not really. Oh, so how does um, Guinness, or is it, I'm assuming it's Guinness, but how did the world record people validate this? Were they there? Did you have spotters? Do you just do you self-report? I'm always curious about how that works. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the main uh, way of documenting it is that we've been taking the photos and 
they're uh, all stamped with uh, GPS and uh, time. Mm. So uh, it shouldn't be any doubt uh, about it. Any diabetes issues along yeah. the way? I mean, it was only one day, but you know, I'm sure that you were on top of everything as you are. Yeah, absolutely. And the, I mean, the, the requirement for blood glucose testing, uh, I think I, I did count mine up. It was about 37 tests and they ranged from about 108 to, I think it was 202. And the average was around about 155. Um, from memory. So it, it works really well. But I think we, we both use continuous glucose monitoring and we find that a very powerful adjunct to the blood glucose testing protocol. Um, so know that there were no moments or, or concerns with the, the diabetes management. And for me personally, I, um, I think Thor, you were probably the same actually. We're, we're kind of munching away on snacks, not eating too much at any time and probably relatively lower carb just uh, for, for me personally i find that works very well for keeping kind of less amplification of your blood sugar uh, changes and and yeah it works really well i'm curious you mentioned the cgm i know uh that dexcom was a sponsor of this trip which is it, when you look at the pictures it's great to see that mm -hmm. i'm curious doug you know you were douglas you were diagnosed before cgm technology what do you make of it? Uh, has it really been helpful in your day to day? Forget being a pilot. Has it has it been helpful to you overall? Yes, it really has. So um, I started to use uh, CGM in 2009, and it was absolutely fantastic. And I got used to it very quickly. And if ever, for whatever reason, I'm without it, I almost feel a bit naked, actually. So for day to day management, I find it a very powerful tool. So it's just great being able to detect trend lines and then being able to you know, actively manage your, your diabetes accordingly. So, yeah, I, I love it. I, I think it's, uh, it's a very powerful tool. And I can talk more about the flying element because it has really the potential to help to open doors for countries who are considering introducing um, policy to enable pilots with, with diabetes to fly. Now, tell me about that. Is it because there is such a long record or, or is it also, I would assume it's because the, the person using it has more information? Absolutely, yes. The, the, the pilot or the individual has much more information. So, I mean, I personally, when I'm flying, I'll, I'll check my CGM at least every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I like to do. And that way I find it's, it's a great way to detect uh, any trend lines and then manage accordingly. So I, I gave a talk at, um, it was a, a, a really global aviation senior medical officer um, conference in the UK in 2014. And it was very interesting because it's quite early days for countries to be considering. And we're very keen that they do. And there are a couple of European countries who were kind of reluctant to introduce policy but they made the comment that they felt that CGM has the potential to open doors because they can see that it can help people, um, you know, help control tighter blood sugars. Yeah, I mean, that's been very encouraging to, to hear as well. Thor, what about you? I don't want to make this into a big Dexcom commercial, but I'm just curious, <laughs> has, um, you know, has, has your, did you uh, start using CGM a while ago? Was it more recent for you? And how does it help you? Yeah, it was, uh, I was diagnosed in August and the nurses, I, I explained to them the situation with me trying to maintain a pilot. So they were really helpful and I got one uh, for trial in December. And uh, to me, it was uh, really a breakthrough because not only the information that you have at hand at the time that you've already mentioned, but it's the, it's everything that you learn while wearing it. Like uh, when you do a blob, just a uh, regular blood check, you get like a blind spot information and you have no idea what's going on until you take the next one. So when you get the graph, you, you'll be able to, and I'm wearing it every single day, 24 hours. Mm. So you just learn uh, how all these factors affect your blood sugar, like uh, exercise during the exercise, after exercise, a few days after exercise, everything that you eat, how all these things uh, uh, affect your glucose levels and you can use that information to to further control your uh, blood sugars with insulin or whatever you you want to do so uh, also it was really a boost to my uh, motivation to keep this case going when I learned about it because it's been a great tool to use as an argument towards the authorities 
And uh, I've seen that a lot of the medical personnel and these guys, they they really notice uh, the arguments with the CGM. And I've used all the data from it to document the, how good control I'm able to have. And with it, I've been logging, uh, I think it was two months when I just decided to just show them wow. uh, <laughs> How good, how good control you can have, and I was between uh, four and ten, one hundred percent of the time. That's fantastic. That is fantastic, Douglas. I, I'm curious too. I wanted before I let you go. I, I wanted to know more about your website. That has had to have been a great source of information for people who are still interested in flying. And as you said, you found you know Thor found you that way. What made you start that? And what have you learned from it? You know, you you have to have connected with so many people over the years. Tell us a little bit about the site. Well, yes, you know what, it's been such a pleasure developing it and um, and just helping put more information out. And in fact, I um, registered uh, a website called pilotswithdiabetes.com and it really triggered that in around about 2007. And that's really used to help enable anyone who loses their medical or may have their type 1 diabetes already um, but want to learn how to fly. They can find out which countries enable you and, you know, how best to try and go about it, or, or at least to help uh, try and, and get back to flying. And then, basically, I've been living in the States uh, between 04 and 07, went back to the UK and back to my um, financial services job, and suddenly found myself, you're getting back to lots of flying projects. And so I set up Flying with Diabetes to coincide with uh, a great project to land in all 48 contiguous USA states and break a previous record. So the Flying with Diabetes was actually set up a little bit later, but interestingly, that, that was the one that Thor found and then found mm. all the details behind the, the record flights. But I link both uh, sites to each other so people can find out information on, on either all the exciting flying projects that have been done or you know, just straightforward information on, on where you can fly with diabetes and, and potentially how to go about it. I don't know if you can answer this question, but let's give it a shot. What do you both just love about flying. Thor, let me start with you. What is it about getting in a plane or a helicopter that somehow is so rewarding to you that you're fighting for the right to do it? What is it not about it? <laughs> it's just the ability to go everywhere. It's speed, it's the action, and it's personally, uh, my dream has always been to fly the rescue helicopters, search and rescue helicopters, so it's it's all fun. It's like driving a go-kart as a kid, just except it's also a valuable job. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's so much to it for me uh, that just made it the obvious choice uh, to the point where as as much as I could affect that myself and I sent an application. I was never in doubt to do that. And if I didn't get into the military, I would have probably have tried to do it outside of the military. But no, I don't know. It's uh, just the feeling of freedom, I guess. How about you, Douglas? I would echo that absolutely and wholeheartedly. I think it's the freedom. But I grew up in, in the Highlands of Scotland watching uh, Royal Air Force fast jets flying at 250 feet above the ground. And I was just in, enraptured. And it just captured my imagination as a young boy. And that's what I really wanted to do. I think it's... Um, it's exercising, I think there's an excitement, you gain skills which enable you to fly from A to B, the freedom to fly. And I know Thor and I both thoroughly enjoy low level flying. And in the military, you, you really, it's a very, very exhilarating pastime. And we, we both thoroughly enjoyed flying low over the, the hillsides in Virginia mm. and North Carolina. And it's just a, a, a really an incredibly pleasurable experience and just the spirit of freedom and being in the air. And I, I think it's, um, it can be a very personal thing, actually, but it's, uh, it's a, a very, very strong passion. That's wonderful. Any you plan? should try it yourself, Stacey, and you'll find out. Oh, 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 oh. I wasn't going to bring <laughs> it up. I am not a good flyer. <laughs> Are pilots good passengers? I guess that's the question to ask, because I don't know how I would be if I was flying the plane. I might be a little less nervous. Yeah, you could be. Um, it, it's okay. Occasionally, I, I take people flying who may start to get motion sickness. And if they do, I'll give them the controls, give them a quick lesson. And they often find focusing on the flying actually makes them feel better. And, and, and they can be quite surprised at how much they, they really enjoy it as well. 
Yeah, Luna Pilots actually are afraid of heights. Uh, Come on! At least of the ones uh, I know. Uh, there's quite a few that actually afraid of heights. That is funny. <laughs> no, there's a family joke because I we travel quite a bit. We're very fortunate, but I do not enjoy the flying experience. But my husband and my daughter both want to learn to fly. They want to get their pilot's license. And I'm, when she's 18, she can go ahead and do it. But it's funny that you bring that up. I'm not going to be sharing this episode with them. Too bad for them. Before I let you go, <laughs> any plans to break this record again or, or to try something similar in the future? Oh, uh, Actually, it's Laura and I, we, we'd love to do more projects. We just need to work out what to do. I think this was a particularly exciting one mm-hmm. because it, it's such an endurance record and uh, it's such a great achievement um, to beat the existing record um, really significantly. So no specific plans, but we're, we're putting our thinking caps on about what we can do next. Wonderful. Well, let me know and we'll, we'll send you a microphone even. You can do something from the cockpit or as you fly around, you could be a travel guide. <laughs> sure. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me to talk about this. It, it's a remarkable record, but I think even what you're doing day to day to push for this, for more people to be able to do what you've done is remarkable. And, and, and I really appreciate you coming on to share it with us. Thank you. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. More information about uh, their flight, the, the route, pictures at diabetes-connections.com. Just click on the show notes that are in every episode. And I'm also, of course, going to link up to Douglas's two different websites, Flying with Diabetes, Pilots with Diabetes. A lot of really good information there and some more behind-the-scenes stuff about this flight. Yeah, I'm a terrible flyer, which is funny because, you know, we're very fortunate. We travel a lot. And I, I travel occasionally now for the podcast and for, you know, to speak at different events and things several times a year with or without the kids. I hate flying. I think, well, if you know me enough by now, you'll probably say, Stacy, this is all about control, right? It's so much easier for me to drive a car than be a passenger in a car. Same thing. I'm sure if I got into a plane with Douglas and Thor, I'd be great if they put me at the controls. <laughs> Don't do that. Let's never do that. <laughs> it's actually a pretty terrible idea. But I love that when they talked about pilots, you know, being afraid of heights and that sort of thing. It all makes sense. When you're in the driver's seat, everything's a little bit different. Time for our No Better segment. It is a bit of an editorial this week. I have noticed a lot of the dreaded being used all over Facebook. And I want to talk to you about that. No Better is brought to you by No Better Foods. No Better is the first natural, non-GMO, grain-free and great tasting alternative to traditional grain-based bread that is gluten, wheat, dairy, peanut, soy yeast, and preservative free. This is a very unique product. It is the best ranking on overall nutritional and glycemic index scales. And it's good. It tastes good, which is really the bottom line, right? I mean, if you're going to have a gluten-free waffle, it better taste good. If you're going to have gluten-free buns and uh, pasta and all the other products that they make, the muffins are so good, it better taste good. It better feel good in your mouth. And that's what I like about No Better Foods. When my doctor asked me to go gluten-free last fall, gosh, almost a year ago already, I was very nervous because I like food. I like bread. (laughs) And this has really helped me make that transition. I love how they say no guilt because there really isn't any. Check it out. Go to diabetes-connections.com, click on the No Better logo, and you can always save it. Check out with the promo code STACY10. As I've mentioned before, I run um, two Facebook groups now. I run the Diabetes Connections The Group, which I really hope you're in. It's a great group of people, good discussions, really nice uh, cross section of people from the diabetes community. So come on in. I do ask you a couple of questions to make sure that we belong there. We don't want people there who are, are just there to sell us stuff or, uh, you know, exploit the group. So I do ask a couple of questions and I keep a tight ship as I do on my other group, which is the very first Facebook group I started five years ago. It is a Charlotte parent Facebook group. It's for parents of, of kids with type one in this area. And I started it because we had no way of finding each other. We just wanted a way to connect by geography and meet up in person. And it's been amazing. We have more than 600 people. But again, I I run a tight ship. It is not a typical parent diabetes group in that 
I don't need to go into a lot of detail, but I, let's just say I don't allow a lot of drama. Don't uh, allow pictures of children in distress. I do not allow rash pictures in the posts. You can put those in the comments, but those are not allowed to be in the actual post. That's my personal feeling. Um, if someone wants to see that and help you out, they can click on the comments. <laughs> Interestingly enough, that's the toughest one to enforce. People love to post rash pictures on Facebook. Get that out of my timeline. Okay, but but what I want to talk to you about today is a post that I put in the parent group and I got blowback on. I got, it was a little controversial. So here's what I wrote. What do you think? You know what I would love to see? For D parents, especially experienced ones, to stop using the dreaded as a descriptor, the dreaded endo visit, the dreaded stomach bug, the dreaded movie popcorn. Are you really dreading those things? Illness can be tricky, but it's not a guaranteed trip to the hospital or into DKA like some will have you believe. Your endo is not someone to be feared or who judges you. And if that's the case, it's time to switch. Our kids pick up on language and they can easily come to fear diabetes if we let them. I just see a lot of sad and fearful posts in other groups. Yes, T1D sucks. Of course, I worry. And there's nothing wrong with going to the hospital if you need to. But let's start with the expectation that we can do this, not with the dread that we can't. And I got a lot of responses to that of people saying, yeah, I, I agree with that. And if I say dreaded, it's just kind of like, oh, haha, I'm kind of kidding. You know, the dreaded question marks you get from your Dexcom sometimes when you're waiting for it to figure out what the heck is going on. But I had one person leave the group. I had her say this was incredibly insensitive. And I have forgotten, as an experienced parent, what it's like to be scared and that some things about diabetes we should be fearful of. And then, then there was a lot of in-between stuff. But I, I would love to know what you think. I talk to a lot of newly diagnosed parents. I'm going to a coffee this week. There's going to be one or two people there whose children were recently diagnosed or, you know, within the last six months. And I am almost always asked, Wow, you know, Benny was diagnosed almost 12 years ago. How many times have you been back to the hospital? And the answer is we've been back to the hospital a couple of times, but never for diabetes. I mean, we've been there for stitches and other dumb kid stuff. Thank goodness, you know, everything was able to be repaired. <laughs> but um, but we've never been to the hospital. Now, a part of that is because we've been lucky. I don't think there's anything wrong with going to the hospital if you need to. You know, the number one reason I see anecdotally that you really need to go is dehydration, right? I mean, if you have an illness or, or you really are dehydrated, that's something that you can't keep up with at home sometimes. So there's no shame. I'm not trying to say don't go to the hospital if you need to. But starting with the expectation that your child throws up and you have to go to the ER is something I think social media has caused. And one of the responses I put to the woman who was calling me out before she left, I hope she saw it, was, I think social media is really pushing a lot of fear along with a lot of support. And I am all for making the latter, making support stronger on social media than fear. When Benny was diagnosed, we didn't have Facebook. And I'll tell you what, I didn't think to be fearful with my two-year-old about a little bit of puke. I called my endo. He told me how to handle it, and we moved on. So I'm not saying don't keep an eye on things. I'm not saying diabetes doesn't suck. But I'm saying if you're dreading everything about it, maybe back up and think, why? What are you really scared of? And how can your care team help you not to be so fearful? If all the information you're getting is on Facebook, back up and think about all the fabulous people that are living great lives with diabetes. Yeah, I know I'm a little bit of a Pollyanna, but the reality is you need to be smart. I'm a parent. I worry. I worry about everything. But you need to have perspective and we need to be careful with our language. I don't want Benny growing up thinking that he needs to dread his diabetes. Okay, off the soapbox. Let me know what you think. And now, if I may say so, you know better. Okay, fabulous parent that I am. I know you want to hear that camp went great, that my son was incredibly disciplined. He did everything we asked. But if you heard last week's interview... You know that um, Benny takes his diabetes seriously, but maybe not himself so much so. So I will give you a very quick update on what happened for the four weeks he was away at camp. Bottom line, he did great. He really did. Um, his blood sugar, as always, ran a little higher than it would have been at home. The biggest problem this year, in the past, we've had some really roller coaster weeks. He'll go super high. He'll go low. This was really interesting. His nights were good. After the first couple of days when he was going low, we adjusted that. Um, so his nights were really good. He was, again, higher range than at home, but, you know, perfectly safe and very reasonable. But afternoon corrections 
just weren't happening. I could see. I mean, you can see that he bolused for his meals, but he probably was under bolusing, which is easy to do. I mean, this is a regular summer camp, so there's no carb counts. I have made carb menus for him in the past, so he knows what's in this food. But he he probably under bolused, which is something that he does all the time. And those corrections didn't happen. So instead of a, a roller coaster up and down, he was just hanging out at numbers that were a little higher than he would have at home. So we'll be looking at that to see how we can help him next year a little bit more. I'm really hoping that Tandem has the Control IQ out for next summer because that would have been perfect for here, right? A little higher in the afternoon, you know, cruising around at 210, an hour or two after lunch, and then it would have smoothed that down without an actual, an addition correction. So he's correcting, you know, at four or five o'clock. And that high could have been corrected much earlier in the day. You know, we'll see what happens. But I'm really happy. He had a great summer, one of the best summers he's had. He had the lead in the play. They do a musical every summer. Um, and he came home and asked me for voice lessons. So we're starting those. So that was a lot of fun for him. I do want to say a quick thing about adhesives, because um, if you've listened to the show or, or read my blog uh, or, or whatever on Facebook for a long time, nothing works for us. Benny has had no luck with Griff Grips and Rockadex, and I don't mean to be putting these brand names out here as, as you know, bad, because they're not, but everyone's skin is so different, and, you know, they don't tell you that. So, you know, we've tried so many different things. We've tried K-Tape, we've tried Vet Wrap, we've tried Sleek Sleeves, uh, you know, I did a whole show on adhesives, and if you listen to that show, we've tried everything that I mention, and um, nothing works. Everything just peels right off, and I think he's kind of a sweaty kid. So I'm at Friends for Life, and uh, the phone rings. And it's Benny. It's a day. What day was it? It was Monday. So it was a day after camp had started. My Dexcom came off. I was like, oh, you got to be kidding already. So we talked about it. I was sitting, I'm going to name drop here. I was having dinner with Carrie from six until me. And uh, she's listening to the phone call. I mean, we're right there. And she suggested, she's like, shave your arm. And he's yelling back, I'm not that hairy. It was really funny. But we decided that the um, the problem was he's carrying a backpack all the time at camp. He always has that backpack with him, and it's coming on and off, coming on and off. It's not like it's once a day at school or in between classes. He's pulling that string bag on and off. So we thought maybe it was catching on the Dexcom. So after two of them came off, he moved it to his stomach. And of course, I'm on the phone calling Dexcom. You know, I need you to send another one to camp. I need you to send another one to camp. And like everybody with the G6, we don't have a stockpile. I don't have any extras. So they're sending them to camp. And But then at Friends for Life, I met the guys from Stay Put. I have met them before. And honestly, I kind of said, yeah, yeah, nothing works for us. And we didn't really try it. So I said, all right, I'm desperate. Give this to me. I'm going to send it to him at camp. Tell me how to do it. You know, what's the method? And it's the same as everything else. Clean with alcohol. If you use it, throw some skin tack on top of there or another barrier sticky wipe that you use. There are a couple of different brands out there. And then put the Stay Put sticker on top and try to avoid going into water I want to say he said for at least two hours. But when I sent it to Benny, I said, overnight, try to put this on at night. So I hear nothing. I hear nothing. I called the infirmary a week later and said, hey, you know, everything's good, I guess. But if he needs more G6s, please let him know. I don't have any more to send him. He needs to let me know. And they were like, oh, he's great. He's fine. I guess it was staying on. He gets in the car when camp is over. And it wasn't the first thing I asked him but it was close. And I said, you know, what's going on with your Dexcom? Is it still on? And he said, mom, the stay put was amazing. Game changer. It was still on. It worked great. He used it as instructed, which was a miracle in and of itself. He did say that the first one he put on, he took off after I want to say, he wasn't really clear on how many days he thought it was seven or eight. He said it was really itchy. He wasn't sure if it was the tape that was itchy or the Dexcom, whatever. I'll take seven or eight days at camp, better than half a day. So we're stay put customers, and we're really happy about that. I was thrilled that we found something, because that is just the frustration, isn't it? I mean, these devices are so great. I mean, I'm looking up the implantable CGM. That's what I was doing while he was at camp. I was thinking, well, I don't like the way this thing sounds. But, you know, if you put it in in May and it stays in until September, it might be worth it. Right? I mean, if it works really well, and I'm so I'm following that one, I'll be honest with you. I'm following that very closely. Because if, if you know, stuff sliding off your kid's body, that's no good either. Anyway, bottom line, stay put worked really well for us. I'm going to put a link in the show notes. 
But I do think you need to try all these different things. We're so lucky here that we have all these meetups where we do trade stuff back and forth. Uh, I mean, I have samples and I've given out to people because it's, you know, uh, sometimes with this stuff, all you have to do is try. All you can do is try to see if it works for you. And the funny ending to this story, although depending on your sense of humor, is that when Benny came home wearing his G6, I asked him a couple of times, how much time does that have left? I don't know. Can you look? I don't know. And of course, the follow app will not tell you how much time is left on the sensor. And I didn't push it uh, because I had way too much other stuff going on. And then, of course, you know, it dies and we have no more G6s. He didn't realize that. He thought that we talked about it. He thought I was in and I'm writing him letters. I mean, do you have any left? What's going on? He thought I was doing that because there were no more sensors at camp. He assumed as and I can see how he does this because he doesn't order supplies. He assumed that we, you know, we have an unlimited supply at home because he's never really been in a situation, knock wood, where we haven't had something for him to use. So he was pretty unhappy. Um, I gave him the choice of finger sticks or the Libre because we have we have uh, the Libre from when we tried that in the spring. Um, of course, he went with the Libre because this kid is not going back to several finger sticks a day after using uh, the G6 for a couple of months now. And I ordered more sensors from Dexcom. And by the way, the only reason he's unhappy about the Libre is because he says it's much easier to just look at his phone rather than scanning. And he does like the alarms. So I thought it was just me. But uh, he said, no, he's gotten used to them and he, he really likes them. And he likes the predictive low alert that Dexcom has. So I'm, you know, you learn that your kids are actually listening and paying attention sometimes. So that was pretty cool. And uh, and just in case, I know this is a long story, but I want to add one more thing. Just in case you think I have a lot of pull with Dexcom. <laughs> I called them to reorder the G6s on Monday. So as you're listening, it's like a week. So hopefully this is all resolved. But I called them and they said, we need another authorization from your insurance company. I said, that's really weird because we just started the G6 six weeks ago, maybe eight weeks ago. And they said, you have a one day authorization, a one day authorization. I was only allowed to order sensors for the one day that I ordered them. That's got to be part of the um, the media push that they did, right? I mean, we got our first sensor and transmitter when um, they sent it out to media outlets. And it had to have been for that. I don't know how I was able to reorder because I did. I reordered a month's supply and I reordered replacements that I sent to Benny at camp. So the woman I talked to said, well, you just got lucky because you're not supposed to get anything else without more authorization from your insurance company. <laughs> So, you know, you know how these things play out. If I called back, I'd probably get a different person who handled it in a different way. But I'm sure we'll get some new sensors soon. All right, I'll keep you posted. Anyway, lots of great stuff coming up. Next week is uh, Safe at School. We're going to be talking about back to school and the American Diabetes Association legal protections for your child, not just for um, elementary school and middle school and high school. But for daycare, I, I really think this is important to get that out there. There's a lot of confusion about daycare, private daycare. Bottom line, your kid still has a lot of protection, and we will be talking about that. Big thank you to my editor, John Buchanan, from Audio Editing Solutions. And thank you as you listen. I'd love to get your feedback on what you're hearing week by week. Let me know what you want more of, what you want less of. I read every email. I see every post. And don't worry, you will not hurt my feelings. I worked in news radio for more than a decade. I have heard it all. <laughs> I don't miss those days. Oh, my goodness. It was a lot of fun. But yeah, political talk radio is not where I want to be right now. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacy Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacy Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>